I want to talk about the fact that the law is abolished and the way that in Matthew 5.17, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not come to destroy but to fulfill, actually refers to something completely different than is usually characterized. And what it's normally used to say is that Jesus didn't come to destroy the law, but to perfectly keep it, and maybe even to, to enforce it, or to show that you can't keep it, or there's a variety of different things, but that what he's actually saying here is that he's not come to just complain about things, but to actually replace Moses and make a change. And so... We'll dig into that, but before that, I want to touch on something from also in Matthew chapter 5 that was in the Be Perfect video toward the end where it was talking about an, uh, turning the other cheek and so forth, and I spoke about how this was part of a principle of giving, asking nothing in return, but it can make it sound like you're being a doormat, and it can make it sound like he's even saying not only let yourself be a victim, really let yourself be a victim when that's actually quite opposite of what's being said because what he's really saying is that this law that victimizes you has another side to it that you can use to exert at least some element of control over the situation. And it might not be by a whole lot, but it's still an amount that you get to, as a victim, exert control over the situation. And so we'll look at that real quick first. And it says uh, in verse 38, uh, verse 38, Matthew 5, You have heard it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So this sounds like it's saying somebody smacks you and then you just go like, go ahead, hit me again. Go ahead, hit me again. Go ahead, hit me again. And that's not actually what it's saying. What it's actually saying is that someone could slap you. And if they did that, if you were one of the lesser social classes, somebody was allowed to smack you, and they're just allowed to if they're at a higher social status than you, but only with the open palm of their hand. And so what it's saying is that when someone smacks you, now turn to them the other side of your face. And if you do that... Now, all of a sudden, they don't have a flat-on ability to hit you on the right cheek anymore because your face is kind of sideways, pointing the left one to them. So now if they're going to hit you again, if they're going to try and strike you again, the only way to do that is with more of like a jab or uppercut with a fist. And they can't do that unless they're going to acknowledge you as socially being equal to them. So... While the abuse is going to continue either way, what you're doing is you're saying, if you're going to hit me, you're going to acknowledge me as your equal. So in verse 40, it says, And if any man will sue you at law take away, uh, and take away your coat, let him have your cloak also. And this is literally saying, like, you know, continue to undress and embarrass the person who's making you give up your coat as collateral. And so we can see in Exodus chapter 22, it says about lending, it says that if you lend any money to someone that's poor, that you're not allowed to charge usury, which is interest. But it also says in verse 26, if you take away your neighbor's raiment to pledge, you shall deliver it to him by that sun goes down, for that is his covering only, and it is raiment for his skin. Wherein shall he sleep? And when it shall come to pass, when he cries to me, I will hear, for I am gracious." So it's saying that there's a certain amount that you have to allow the person to have his clothing because that's all he's got. And that you even have to return the the pledge, the, the portion that he gave to you as a pledge, a promise of repayment, before the sun goes down so that he can have it to sleep in the cold. And in Deuteronomy chapter 24... It's the same thing, verse 10. When you lend your brother anything, you shall not go into his house to fetch his pledge, which is the the clothing offered for a promise of repayment. You shall stand abroad outside, and the man to whom you lend shall bring out the pledge abroad unto thee. And if the man be poor, you shall not sleep with his pledge. That's not, you know, uh, 
<laughs> you're not sleeping with a sorority sister. <laughs> it's talking about the clothes that he's offered as the promise of repayment. And in any case, you shall deliver him the pledge again when the sun goes down, that he may sleep in his own raiment and bless you, and it shall be righteousness unto you before the Lord your God. So when it says this, it's you're, it's saying that if the guy tries to take your clothes as collateral, then just keep undressing. Embarrass him. Um, and it really is saying, like, you know, you're really going to take all that I have here, take literally all that I have. And so make him the, make him the object of humiliation. Um, because you can't actually legally refuse to give him the collateral, but you can say, look, look what you're doing to me. Look what you're doing to me. You're taking everything I have by, you know, don't stop there. Offer him your cloak also is saying, you know, just continue undressing. <laughs> And and make a fool out of the guy that is trying to take almost all that you have as collateral by giving him all you have. And then in verse 41, And whosoever shall compel you to go a mile, go with him too. And this is the Roman soldiers were allowed to force you as an obligation that you were to carry their stuff for a distance. And we'll call it a mile. That's, who cares? It's whatever distance it was. And at the after at the end of that distance that you were required to carry the stuff, he was required to say that you were fulfilled your obligation and you can set the stuff down. And you'd probably grudgingly do this. You'd reach the mile mark. You'd set the stuff down. You'd grumble under your breath and flip him the bird secretly and be on your way. Um, and Jesus is saying, instead of doing that, since you can't protest whether or not you pick the stuff up, what you can do is refuse to put it down. So now the soldier says, okay, you're, you're done. Put the stuff down. You go, no, I'm good. I'm good. I can keep going. I, I needed some more exercise anyway. I got nothing to do. I'm happy to carry this stuff. I'm, I'm going to just, I can keep going. And he says, no, put it down. I'm just, because now he's the transgressor because he's not allowed to let you keep carrying it, but you're refusing to set it down. He's stuck in a loophole where he was allowed to make you pick it up, but he's not allowed to make you put it down. But he's not allowed to let you keep carrying it. So you flipped the, the tables, and you can imagine that something like this, if people did it on a large scale, is going to result in them realizing that now, in order to stay out of trouble with people carrying our stuff for us, we're going to just have to pay them to carry our stuff. It's going to be an advancement against this abuse. And that's what the principle that Jesus is saying here. He's not saying not only be a doormat, but doubly be a doormat. He's saying you can flip this abuse and at least have some element of control over it where even though it's still going to be an ongoing abuse, you can exert some control over it. You can exert some kind of protest over it because the law can be exploited to your advantage uh, in these cases. So it's absolutely not about just being a full-on doormat and letting people get away with whatever they, they're doing to you. It's about having some feeling of empowerment in a situation of being abused. So now this gets to our main topic here, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, where it says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am, come, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And so... This is misrepresented in numerous different ways. But when you take it just at face value and, and without understanding what's really going on here, you can think, well, if Jesus didn't come to destroy the law, then we must still be under the law. Or, you know, under whichever parts Jesus we think that Jesus affirmed, those are the parts that we're keeping and these other parts we got rid of or something. Whatever it is, there's a whole different variety of ways. But what this really is, and if, if you can grab onto this, this is like, let's say in a company, there's a guy and he's complaining about policies. And he's saying, you know, this policy is, is not a good policy. And this way of doing business needs to change. And this is something that needs to stop. And let's say some officials from the company come and say, you know, pal, if you don't shut up, you're going to be in trouble. 
you need to stop complaining about the way things are going are, are run around here okay so what Jesus is saying he's being approached by the, the company officials and they're complaining that he's saying things against the law of Moses they're accusing him basically of t having teachings that are contrary to the law of Moses so they're like the company officials saying, look, pal, you need to stop complaining about doing things. And Jesus is saying, oh, no, you've got it all wrong. I'm not a, an employee below you. I'm the new head of the company above you. And I'm not complaining about the way things are being done. I'm telling you the new policy. And so that's what Jesus is actually saying in Matthew 5, 17. Think not I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. What he's really saying is, I'm not some rabble rouser complaining about the way things are being run around here. I'm the new CEO of the company. I'm the replacement for Moses. It's worse than you think. I'm telling you the new way. I'm telling you my way. And so if you are the new head of a company and somebody says, you know, when Jeff was running the company, we didn't do things that way. Said, I don't care what he did. I'm in... <laughs> It's my company now. We do things my way. You know, if that was actually a better way, maybe it's worth discussing. But, I mean, whatever he did, that's got nothing to do with what the company is now because it's mine. So Jesus is proclaiming ownership when he says this passage here. He's saying, I'm replacing Moses. I'm not just some guy complaining and being a rebel and running around and complaining and trying to, you know make trouble, I'm telling you what the new kingdom, the new policy that I reign over is. And so if you can grab onto that, and you can understand that Jesus was proclaiming his replacement of Moses, that it's far worse than they ever thought. Okay, well, if he's the replacement for Moses, then whatever he says goes. And whatever Moses says is irrelevant. Because... Moses's policies are not his, and his are not Moses's, and you're not under Moses anymore, you're under me. I'm replacing the guy that you think is in charge. And so, we get to verse 18, it says, Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And so, let's look at this. Most people say, well, looks like terra firma is still here, so I guess that the law is not passed away. But let's look at it differently. If one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass till all be fulfilled, okay, that's that's one jot is the letter yod, which kind of looks like an apostrophe. And one tittle is the little dots that you see around the letters when you look at Hebrew writing. They're called diacritics. They indicate vowel points, so they tell you how to pronounce different things. That's what a jot and a tittle is. They're the two smallest markings that can appear in the written version of the law. So the two smallest markings, not even one of those little dots or little apostrophe looking things, which is actually a letter, but not even the smallest marking shall pass away unless all be fulfilled. So it would seem that we should be able to agree that the sacrificial system is gone, which means that more than a jot and a tittle has passed away. So therefore, all must be fulfilled. And we can go and look at Hebrews 7.12, and we're going to look at this, because in uh, starting at verse 11, it says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there to be another priest should, that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek, and not be called after the order of Aaron? So this is even saying that... Uh, Jesus wasn't even a priest according to the law. According to the law of Moses, Jesus had no right to be proclaimed a priest by anybody. And so this is saying, no, he's not after the order of Aaron, he's after the order of Melchizedek, which is a story going back to the time of Abraham. Verse 12, for the priesthood being changed. Well, right there it's saying that the law of Moses has been changed. The priesthood has been changed. A, someone who is not lawful to be priest by the law of Moses is now priest. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. The law has changed. 
right there, verse 12, Hebrews, Hebrews 7, verse 12, it tells you the law has changed, right there. So something about the law has changed, more than a jot and a tittle, so all must be fulfilled. If we're going to take that at face value, till heaven and earth pass away is not the part to fixate on, because that's talking about the temple anyway. It's not talking about terra firma. It's not talking about sky and stars, you know, when you, when you go out and you look at the constellations. But it says that not one jot or tittle will pass away until all is fulfilled. Well, right here it's telling us that there's a change to the law. If there's a change to the law, then all must be fulfilled. It says, verse 13, For he of whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe, which no man gave attendance at the altar. In other words, there's no law that says he's allowed to be a priest. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concern, concerning priesthood. Okay? Tribe of Judah is not priesthood. Tribe of Levi is. And it is far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment. So what would be a carnal commandment? It's clearly calling the law of Moses that, that appoints the tribe of Levi as the priesthood is a carnal commandment. So let that sink in for a second. But after the power of an endless life, for he testifies thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, which is a quote from Psalms 110.4. Now it says, for there's verily a disannulling of the commandment. Disannul, it, that means it's void. The commandment is void, going before the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing of a better hope did by the which we draw nigh unto God. How do we draw near unto God? Not by the law, but by the bringing of a better hope. And inasmuch not without an oath he was made a priest. So it says, there's no law that made him a priest, but there is an oath that came from God. And it says, for those priests were made without an oath. They're appointed because of the Levitical law. But this with an oath by him that said to him, the Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. In other words, when they died, they ceased to be priests. But this man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. He never dies, so he never ceases to become a priest. Wherefore, he is also able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needs not daily as those high priests to offer up a sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. So it's saying all he even did was offer up himself. He made no offering for his own sins. He completely did not follow the law of Moses and the commandments regarding who gets to be a priest and how that priest operates. That's what this is saying in the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews is a great book at looking at just the systematic dismantling of the law in comparison to, to the new commandment and the New Testament of Christ. And it systematically dismantles it. A good, a, it's just an excellent study to look at. And also the uh, book of Galatians is an excellent dismantling of the law. And if you can understand the sarcasm and the ridicule that's in the book of Romans, then the book of Romans completely demolishes the Mosaic law. Uh, but you have to understand the, the ridicule that's in there, where it says, like, you know, is the law sin? <laughs> oh, no, of course not. The law's great. The law's fantastic. I mean, I was alive until the commandment came, and then I died. But, I mean, you know, the law is just fantastic. It's, it, it makes sin abound everywhere and it's holy and it's just and it kills people and isn't it great? So you got to understand there's sarcasm there. Is the, is the, is the law sin? Yeah. Um, so those are excellent sources, you know, at looking at how the law is not something that is being promoted. It's something that's very much being contested uh, mocked, ridiculed, systematically dismantled uh, in every way possible. So we can see there 
that there's multiple references saying that the law is being not followed in terms of the priesthood. The law is voided by the New Testament. And so what we have here is a law that has clearly been abolished. So if it says one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled, and any part of that law is voided, as we've seen in Hebrews 7, then all must be fulfilled. And that's all there is to it. So, and that's just going to hurt some people. <laughs> um, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's going to be something to grapple with. But so we get to verse 19, it says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. So this is supposedly a proof that Jesus didn't break any commandments or teach anybody to do so, because then he would be the least in the kingdom of heaven. But first of all, it says the least in the kingdom of heaven, not someone who's not in the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't say, Whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and teach men to do so, he shall not be in the kingdom of heaven. He shall not die and go to heaven. That's not what it says. It says he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Or we could emphasize it. He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. So apparently he's inside, but called the least. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So now we go and we take a look at this. What if, What's this about the least in the kingdom of heaven? Matthew 11, 11. And I think I actually want to start in verse 10. Yeah. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, which shall prepare the way before thee. Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. So even if you're teaching against the least of these commandments, as Jesus said, you're still greater than John the Baptist. According to that, I mean, we're just putting the pieces together here. He that teaches men, uh, breaks the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so is greater than John the Baptist. I don't know wh how that gets characterized as to won't die and go to heaven, but that's not what it says. So it's not an affront to Jesus to be somehow greater than John the Baptist when that's who John the Baptist said. He said, I'm not even worthy to buckle his shoe. He said, I, you should be baptizing me instead of me, you. So there should be no offense taken there. So now we're going to close out. Am I crazy? Is this ludicrous to think that the law is abolished? Well, let's continue to prove it with Ephesians and Colossians. So we go to Ephesians chapter 2. And I want to start with verse 14. It says, For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of two one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Enmity is the emotion that is associated with being an enemy. So it's kind of like hatred, but it's it's actually, it's the emotion associated with being an enemy. Having slain the being an enemy. That's what it's saying. He might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the being of enemies thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off to them that were nigh. For though... For through him, <laughs> for through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So there it says that the law of commandments contained in ordinances are abolished. That's that's the Ten Commandments. That's the law of Moses. Those are the ordinances. And we further look at this in Colossians chapter 2, starting at verse 8. It says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. 
in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So there it is. The law has been nailed to the cross. It was contrary to us. It was, it was an enemy of us. That law was an enemy of us. And Jesus took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. It doesn't apply anymore. It's abolished. It has passed away, and all has been fulfilled. <laughs>